Hi. Oh, there you are. Oh. Hello. The mics work. Yeah. How's everybody doing? All right. All right. Good crowd. Banner Saga. What even is that? <laughs> okay. Well, we're here to tell you a story about the development of the Banner Saga. We're going to talk about inspiration, ideas, prototyping, and process. I'm John Watson. And my role at the studio has been largely technical over the years, but it's evolved into more of an executive and operational role. Hi, and I'm Zeb West. Uh, I'm the producer. Uh, I oversee the development of Banner Saga and Banner Saga related projects. Um, we will start this story at the very beginning. Uh, the ideation of the saga between the founders of the studio, John, Alex, and Arnie. The development of the Banner Saga began with an epic story, a love of tactical RPGs, and an art style. We were interested in making something in the style of the 20th century master painter, Ivan Durrell. Ivan Durrell, you, you tell me about this. Ivan Durrell, uh, as well as being a painter and illustrator, was art director at Disney starting in the 1950s. Uh, he made his home on the coast of Northern California in the Big Sur area. His paintings strongly incorporated the dramatic scenery and plant life around him. These are all uh, independent works and not done for Disney, but the stylistic elements are clear. You can see that his art style incorporates fine detail and vegetation, especially foliage and the trunks and branches of trees. He often uses a very shallow angle of sunlight, rendering the long dramatic shadows of early morning or late evening. Okay, so this is a, a Disney-produced film. How do we start this? And, uh, I don't know. There we go. There we go. You can see Ivan uh, rendering a tree uh, from life. Uh, you can see the extreme attention to detail uh, renders in his work so exquisite and unique. He honestly makes it look really easy. But the, the fully rendered uh, image that he gets to is quite stunning. So this was the style, that, that our style target. Quite a high bar for our art director, Arnie. <laughs> uh, here's a set of images, both from concept and production, of the 1958 Disney film Sleeping Beauty. Uh, Ivan Earl was the art director on this film. Uh, Sleeping Beauty is a very important film for me. Some years before the inception of the Banner Saga, before I knew who Ivan Earl was, I watched Sleeping Beauty with my, as an adult with my young daughter. And I was absolutely blown away by what I was seeing on the screen. So we asked ourselves, what would it look like to exist in a world like this, to, to travel from place to place? Uh, we had a game design idea that involved traveling across this landscape. Um, to find out how we felt about this, we created this very simple prototype of a world travel scene through a grove of Ivan de Earl's eucalyptus trees. In this set of comparison images, you can clearly see the strong and direct influence of Ivan de Earl's art on the Banner Saga. Here you see the Strav's Godstone, the afterlife, approach to Grofheim, Richhorn, and so on. So once we'd honed in on and uh, prototyped that visual style, we sort of set to work. We developed an epic storyline and mythology based on Norse legends. Uh, for practical reasons, we split the saga into three acts and then began working on the first of these acts. Our influences were games like Final Fantasy Tactics, and we wanted to extend upon that style in combat. We saw one of our largest technical and design risks as the battle system, so we quickly began combat prototyping. We created several touchpad and PC-based prototypes to figure out exactly how we wanted the UI to work. Here you see a functional combat prototype using just the keyframe master poses of the various characters before they were animated. And that's really good programmer UI that I, I made by myself. I can't believe that didn't make it into the final. Yeah, it was yeah. good. It's really good. OK, so the technology stack for Banner Saga began in uh, 2011. Uh, 
who in here was using Unity 3 back in 2011? Okay. Anybody using Flash and Adobe Air back then? Okay, so a few people. Uh, we prototyped our combat system both in Unity 3 and Adobe Air. Um, at the time, Adobe was pivoting away from browser-based Flash because of smartphones and investing in Air, which Air allowed you to package ActionScript bytecode into native applications, both on desktop and mobile. And we ended up using Adobe Air for several reasons. Uh, our hand-animated characters were imported and rendered directly in into the platform. Uh, later, these were optimized into sprite sheets, but we were able to get up and running really quickly with the art style. Uh, Air was also built around a mature technology stack, including Java, Eclipse, and Ant build tasks. It had some great profiling and analysis tools. Unity at the time, as I mentioned, was version 3. It was still fairly new and rough around the edges. One of the primary factors that was against Unity at the time was this endemic reliance on global variables. It made unit testing difficult or impossible in some cases. Uh, obviously, in the seven years since then, Unity is now well known and loved, and Air has receded into obscurity. Uh, the framework provided quick development and deployment, though, onto Mac, PC, uh, iOS, and Android. A critical feature of Air was a native extension system. We can write native code for any platform and integrate middleware such as FMOD for audio and platform specific technology like Steamworks or God Galaxy. We were insistent from the start that if possible, we should put it on as many platforms as, as we could, including console. So we performed some internal prototyping using Scaleform as a wrapper for our ActionScript code. It worked. We proved we could pull it off, so we just continued along this path, and ultimately that's how we ported it to console. Basically, the whole thing is inside its Scaleform wrapper, which uh, is fun. So it's March 2012. Uh, and Kickstarter is just starting as, to explode as a platform uh, with successful projects. And small indie companies uh, like us were finding funding success there independently uh, of publishers uh, and funded by fledgling crowdfunding campaigns. And although Arnie, John, and Alex actually started the company with their own savings, uh, we had kind of a wildly successful early Kickstarter, uh, which allowed us to expand the scope of the game. Uh, into, to include uh, a fully orchestrated classical soundtrack and uh, a world-class sound design team. We were also able to get way more 2D animation by enlisting Powerhouse Animation Studio. Our, that was our biggest bottleneck in time sync because these animations, it takes like a person month to do one set of them for one character. Um, getting help with that was critical. It also allowed us to record uh, authentic Icelandic voiceovers in, uh, using Searland Studios in Iceland. Uh, the biggest reward from the Kickstarter was connecting with 20,000 fans, fully, fully invested fans who'd rallied around the dream of this game. Oh, I don't think we played that. No. That's fine. Okay. Is John looking young and handsome on our Kickstarter. Yeah, so many years ago. Uh, so our first development goal was factions. Uh, factions is something we promised early on during Kickstarter. It's intended to be a multiplayer demo of the combat. It's funny because some people gave us heat for releasing factions first instead of the full game, even though we had promised it that way. The Banner Saga can be decomposed down into several key systems. Uh, so the systems in our game are the branching storyline, the travel in through epic landscapes, like you saw in the prototype, uh, city exploration, including camps and villages, uh, character progression system, which is what makes it an RPG, and the battle system, uh, which John talked about earlier, mm -hmm. and then ultimately the supporting AI for that battle system. So for factions, we chose to focus primarily on battle. Uh, our turn-based tactical system was inspired by other games, but we were taking some new design risks, and we needed to prove them out. So we decided to decrease the risk to the project. We would focus on the combat first. And instead of tackling AI immediately, we decided to make the combat network to multiplayer Instead, so we can engage the audience and get more direct feedback and get bogged down in AI. Yeah, Factions gave us the opportunity to develop combat with the help of this huge uh, Kickstarter community uh, that was just engaged and interested and like we were thriving off of their feedback and they loved kind of having input on the game. Um, it was essentially, it predated Steam early access, but that's exactly what it was. It was just kind of like DIY. Uh, which would tell yeah, we, we, go we asked Steam for something like that, and it wasn't available yet. Yeah, they're like, hmm, we'll think about that. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so 
during this process of making factions and building these in this subset of the game, we were able to start iterating on our tools, uh, tools for building interactive cities. Uh, interactive cities are a broad category. It includes things like villages and camps as well, and unique locations like godstones. You can build out all of the, the appearance and the behavior and everything in this tool. Uh, here you see the same in-house uh, editing tool with the city. Um, this is Strand, the first city you see in the first Banner Saga. Uh, um, our character progression system uh, was fleshed out and refined with the help of our factions community. Um, the factions project was a wonderful experience for our team. It engaged the community immediately. Our initial Kickstarter supporters latched onto it, and a bunch of new players as well came in. Seeing their feedback, responding to it, and collaborating with the players is very satisfying. It really was early access at its best for us. Here you see the battle editor in the tool, setting up animations, battle spawners, the works. Sorry for the Banner Saga 3 spoilers. Yeah, this is a scene in Banner Saga 3. You might recognize it. Uh, so the tool that you've been seeing uh, is our kind of all-encompassing content tool used for editing almost every aspect of the game. It's called Zeno, after the ancient Greek founder of the school of philosophy known as Stoicism. Uh, Zeno has numerous content editing features, and it's built around a core piece of the pipeline, which is our in-house asset compiler. Aside from binary data, such as animations, images, and sound, the game's data and logic are almost entirely expressed through hundreds of structured JSON files. The asset compiler uses a well-defined JSON schema for each data type to ensure correctness. So as you know, you create and modify the, the game, and through the embedded asset compiler, you produce the final in-game assets. Our automated build pipeline uses the asset compiler as a standalone and headless application that is driven by ant scripts, which run on the Jenkins server. Uh, carefully managed asset manifest contains the directives that drive the asset compiler which is the list of files to compile, what compilation methods to use on them, other flags that affect the output. So we have different outputs on different platforms. It compiles the animations differently on console, for instance. And the videos are differently encoded on console and mobile. Um, here's uh, Zeno's travel spline editor panning over a giant scene from Banner Saga 3. And this is where the designers hook up all their logic and uh, the artists lay out the scenes. So let's talk a little bit about server stuff. Um, our server architecture for factions was fairly simple, but it scaled pretty well. The game client had a well-defined set of messages, requests, and responses that could be sent, received, and executed remotely. And these are all structured JSON, JSON messages. The game servers were all HTTP written in Java and deployed into the Heroku system. Heroku is a very easy to use service for deploying and scaling HTTP services. It supports a wide variety of languages and technologies, not just Java, but everything that you would want to use. Um, additionally, Heroku hosted a set of worker servers. These servers handled tasks such as chat, login, and battle. The architecture allowed us to combine several or all worker servers into a single process during times of light load, and during times of high load, we could separate and duplicate worker servers to scale horizontally. Uh, the battle worker was the single most demanding worker and the one that was most likely to be scaled out or duplicated. And behind the scenes, persistent data were stored in a MySQL database hosted on Amazon. And all the message passing was done with a message queue service or system called RabbitMQ, which ran inside an Amazon EC2 instance. Um, one of the very successful techniques we employed was to allow a single game client to host multiple client sessions at once. So we wrapped each session with what we called a game wrapper and rendered each session as a split screen area and then communicated with the server normally from both. So you could play you know, against yourself or anything. You could test out playing both sides of a battle, observing remote effects. You could do as, you know, split it as many times as you wanted, as many times as your computer can handle. And we went a step further and embedded a very simple simulated server into the client application itself so you could test battle synchronization and core networking totally offline. And I cannot overstress the usefulness of simulated systems like these. And for the narrative portions of the game, uh, we wanted a conversation system that supported player choices and branching dialogue. 
Inkle uh, created a tool called Inkle Writer, uh, which is kind of an easy to use graphical interface for creating branching story content. And while this interface was great for us for the first two games, uh, we found that we wanted the flexibility of creating our own version of that tool. We use the underlying tech to create StoryWriter. StoryWriter is based on, loosely on the newer Inkle open source technology called Ink. StoryWriter solved the problems of being connected to the web interface and gave us the freedom to continue to tailor the tool to the Banner Saga. It's it actually, yeah. wasn't as pretty though. That's that's that story writer. I had the wrong slide. This was way prettier. <laughs> and then we this is Zeno again. Zeno has a system for keying and tagging audio, music, and other events with the uh, with the dialogue, so you can have some cool dramatic effects. Okay. So we started out this whole project seven almost seven years ago with just three of us working in a rundown shack in Austin, Texas. This is nothing more than a small storage room in an abandoned livestock barn. We called it the Goat Shack. Uh, during the development of factions, we employed several contractors for a short time, but eventually the three of us had to abandon the shack before it was demolished. We moved into a place called the Swamp Shack. Big upgrade. Due to its pervasive odors and finished the first game. Uh, shortly after the completion of Banner Saga 1, Alex, one of the founders, left to pursue another project. We brought in a technical designer and a writer and began working remotely. I moved out of Texas and went to Seattle, and the entirety of Banner Saga 2 was created in a completely remote manner with all four core team members uh, in different locations. And as the project of making the final part of the trilogy progressed, um, we identified areas in need of improvement in our internal process. Uh, we reestablished working spaces, this time both in Austin as well as in Seattle. We hired more designers and artists and programmers. And Banner Saga 3 is completed with 14 uh, core team members now. And the success of the first game on Steam uh, was kind of beyond the team's original expectations. Uh, so it was now clear that the game was viable for other markets. So porting and localization of the Banner Saga became its own full-time project. And as we've increased our team capacity over the years, we've improved our velocity and reliability. So this chart, the numbers are years. So 2014 is the Saga 1 launch right there. And when we made the first part of the trilogy, we launched in English only, only on Steam. We worked on localization and porting afterwards, as you can see there, going almost to um, uh, 2016, actually into 2016. Um, console porting that first time took us two years to complete. All, and, you know, trickling out the localizations, all that really accomplished was irritating people who were in, like, the second and third wave of please translate. Yeah, for, for Banner Saga 2. Uh, for Banner Saga 2, you see we pulled in um, console, mobile localization much closer to launch. And then finally, for Banner Saga 3, we're going to, for the first time, launching everything simultaneously on all the platforms. Mobile is going to come later. But local, all, the, all the supported languages... Um, uh, PlayStation, Xbox, and Switch. That's a big milestone for us, being able to pull that off is uh, extremely difficult. Yeah, that's been a, a, a substantial challenge for our team, and it's satisfying to see it start to come together. Um, on the chart here, you can also see that we've been busy updating Saga 1 and Saga 2 with Chinese translations and publishing, as well as porting to the Nintendo Switch. Also not shown on the chart are two major Kickstarter projects that we ran, several other PC platform launches like God Galaxy, Twitch Prime, and Wii Game. Um, this is a month, uh, the time scale on this chart is, a, is in months from launch. You can see that we're Saga 1 launched at month zero. It took us over 24 months to reach the console release. Chinese and Switch are actually way off the chart to the right, so I pulled them onto the, as close as I can. They actually should be farther out. For Saga 2, a side-by-side -side comparison shows how much more quickly we were able to execute on porting and localization and bringing it in. And then finally... Yeah, finally, for Saga 3, you can see that almost everything has been front-loaded for a day-and-date launch. Um, and these are the, these are the process uh, improvements we've been able to put into effect. Um, there's many contributing factors. I credit our continued investment into our technology and the ongoing help from our partners and help from our publisher versus Evil. 
So uh, hiring additional internal resources also increased our throughput for development. I mean, I guess this kind of just tells the story of like, you know, a three-person indie studio starting in their garage and how sort of single-threaded they were until we kind of solved some of these um, production problems. Um, and sort of allowing us to the full-scale production phase for Saga 3, uh, even though we did a full reset of the story in spring of 2017 to kind of to be completed uh, in under a year. We did a big retrospective at the end of Banner Saga 2, and we started to identify gaps in our uh, team lineup, uh, what, ex what extra hats that the team was wearing that a dedicated new hire could do an even better job at. And this is when my job as producer was created. And uh, our next immediate hire was a community manager. Uh, toward the beginning of creating Saga 3, we felt like collaboration was being held back by not being in the same room. Something as simple as whiteboarding an idea it could feel tedious over a video conference, which uh, people easily being distracted by notifications and other screen junk. Yeah, we were missing that uh, magic that the original team members had had when they were co-located in the early Austin offices. So uh, we com consolidated into two offices, one in Seattle, Washington, and one in Austin, Texas. And we internally refer to them as the arts and the sciences. Um, Seattle is the sciences, so programming, production, and QA, clearly sciences. Um, and Austin being kind of the arts, uh, where we have all the artists and designers and writer. And uh, we're still kind of working to manage being cross-functional in that way. We, we still have that problem of kind of interacting through video conferencing, which can just sometimes be creatively difficult. Um, uh, but mm -hmm. we personally experienced kind of a huge productivity boost when we co-located. We also uh, invested in leveling up our tools uh, from some indie-style stopgap solutions to more robust long-term solutions. Um, at, first, at first, the volume of customer service tickets that we got in was manageable through distribution lists and filtering in Gmail. Uh, but uh, as more platforms and storefronts and multiple games were added to the mix, we quickly needed a more robust tool like Zendesk. Um, and so that's what we moved into. And one of the best things about Kickstarter is that it assembles your most highly engaged fans um, and we had 20,000 backers from the first Kickstarter, and uh, we were able to migrate most of them into a MailChimp uh, so that we could keep our most invested, um, keep them in invested in Stoic's growth and in our new projects, development updates, and new platform releases. Uh, for Better Saga 1, our Kickstarter backers and fans congregated in our own custom forums. And as new tools like Discord came around, we were excited the more instantaneous communications options, granting a higher level of accessibility for the developers and players, and vice versa. And uh, we, we made one mistake that we identified, um, letting our community kind of wither between Saga 1 and Saga 2. Uh, the team thought that the best thing that we could do was just put our heads down, go into hiding, and just crank out Banner Saga 2. Uh, but the result was that many of our fans didn't even know Saga 2 had come out. So to fix this going forward, we hired a community manager. This is Katie, and she's great. We can't recommend this enough. It allows clear messaging, uh, managing backer issues, monitoring the pulse of your community. And Katie also uh, assembled our most devoted fans into a, a small think tank that we call the Conclave. Um, and it's just kind of a private Discord group that we chat to. Uh, and they help monitor and moderate our community to kind of help set a positive tone and um, for the rest of the community. Yeah, we've always been very lucky with our community, I think. It's uh, largely pretty mature, you know, people who are sensible and reasonable, and they all love the game. And they, we've been really happy with that. So after Saga 2, uh, we decided to consolidate all of our bug and task tracking into JIRA. We were using a tool before that called Fog Bugs which was great, but we just, uh, once, once we were in JIRA, we increased our discipline around epics and task tracking in order to better manage multiple and parallel projects. We're in the... Uh, I, was, I was reading the little tasks on the, on the, uh, on the vlog bug thing. They're pretty funny. Uh, so right now, we're in the process of integrating JIRA with smart sheets in order to have a more roadmap view of projects and resources uh, projected further out into the future. While we work pretty agile as a development 
at the development team level. Uh, like many companies and kind of growing into a mid-sized company, we sort of need a higher level of planning where we want more of that Gantt style roadmap view uh, where we can kind of see how resource changes and delays uh, will impact other projects. Well, building this saga has been one of the most challenging and rewarding things we've ever done. We've, we're actively improving ourselves for the long term. And improving our tools and doing smart hiring has opened up our production bandwidth. Uh, not only did these things help us finish the Saga trilogy, but are serving to set us up to transition into Stoic's next epic adventure after the Saga. So to wrap this up, we want to present you with a little highlight video that we made and we think you will enjoy. Thank you. Uh, we finished a little sooner than we had intended, but that gives us more time to talk. If you have any questions, um, if there's something we kind of glossed over or didn't explain well enough, or is there, it, it, uh, did, did we, we, we tried to share with you uh, just a bunch of information about how we've been doing things, hoping that um, you know, it would be of use to some of you. So I wouldn't mind hearing your thoughts on that. You need to see any of the technical diagrams again? Yeah, we have lots of technical diagrams. Show you those. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how many frames of animation you have per second in the animations in the game? Uh, we, it's animated at 30 frames a second, but a lot of it is done on twos. So it, it, it kind of varies. So by, by default, I guess, around 15 frames a second. But for certain actions, uh, there are more frames for certain motions. So the average frames per second is probably more like 19 or 20. But it's rendering at 30 frames. All, the, all those uh, combat animations that you see in the game, are all, they're all rotoscoped. We did that for several reasons. One of them was to kind of get a retro look. Uh, we wanted to be able to basically act out the, the moves on camera to show the animators what we wanted because <laughs> we thought that was the best way to communicate uh, with them. Uh, so we would, it was us basically acting them out in Arnie's front yard. So I'm all the dredge. All the, all the enemies are me. Um, Arnie is all the, all the human male guys. Alex is all the varl. Uh, Chaley is all the, the archers and the horseborn and uh, Juno and Falka as well. And so we sent all that, we, we, we would take all that video, uh, edit it, edit the video to get the, the kind of timing we were looking for. Then Arnie would paint over the first frame and then we'd let Powerhouse do the rest of the keyframes and all the in-betweens. So it's a very, very labor intensive way to do it, um, rotoscoping, but it gives it, it gives it kind of a unique look. Hey. hey, so you said with the first one you were using ActionScript and Adobe Air. Mm -hmm. Are you using the same or something different for the second and third game? Same engine, same technology. It's, uh, it, I mean, it has, we've, we've built a lot of features into it. it. It's like a million lines of code. It's got all kind of stuff and it works well. Like the, only, the, the, the problem is that you're at Adobe's mercy. You know, if they introduce a bug into the black box of Air, um, then you're kind of screwed. And 
We haven't really had that much problem with that. We've had problems with it on mobile, more so, on Android in particular. Like a uh, version of Air just stops working on Android, and then you have some devices that work. But on PC and Mac and iOS, it's been fairly stable. They, they update Air at about once a month, so they're always fixing bugs and, and um, uh, you know, making it compatible with new platforms. So it's not totally dead. But um, yeah, it, it, it is uncomfortable being at the mercy of a black box like that. And that's, that's one of the worst things about it. But overall, the engine's very capable, so we have all this game logic, so it didn't really make sense for us to change. Also, for making the trilogy, it was very important f to us to make all three of them fit together like one big game. Like You should be able to play them all back to back, and it feels like one game, because it's really one story. And we really don't wanna, didn't want to have some kind of discontinuity. Any kind of technology change would have caused a discontinuity in, in the look and feel and everything else. And I don't think there's any way around that unless you're really, <laughs> I don't know, it would be hard to match. Yep. Hi. Uh, uh, you showed us a lot of the tools you use, and they're very interesting, fascinating, actually. Uh, what I want to ask can you give us an example of the the process, the for example the creative process from idea creation to an asset, from just an example uh, where you could, for example, uh, tell us like I use okay. a tool in this tool in there and then like or something like that, just to connect it a bit better to what you're actually okay. making. Well, uh, I talked a little bit about animation, and I can expand on that animation part a little bit. The animators would animate in Flash, so they produce these Flash files, and then our compiler uh, basically compiles them into sprite sheets, and then the Xeno tool you see there allows you to inspect them and tag up the frames, so the, v the various frames have all sorts of tags on them for special uh, sound effects, footsteps, uh, and all the um, moments when impacts are supposed to happen and things like that. Um, then making the landscapes is a different process. It's done basically in a series, you know, from, from concept to completion. In Photoshop, uh, we have one of our typical landscapes has about seven layers of parallax, sometimes more, but about seven. So all those layers are built in Photoshop, um, and then we have a script that exports them uh, basically into PNGs, PG layers, and then those are loaded into Xeno. And then in Xeno, you take those layers and you configure the parallax, how fast they move against each other, how deep, how far into the background or foreground they are. And then, uh, then once they're in, Arnie can, Arnie, whoever's doing the art for the scenes can you know, re-export them from Photoshop and re-import them into Xeno at any, any time. So that's two things, that's landscapes and that's uh, animations. Um, you know, design is done uh, also, th aside from, you know, design, designing the, 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 the ideas for the abilities, which we kind of do in a collaborative manner. I mean, the designer, like Matt has been our designer, our main designer for several years, and Alex before him, and they kind of come, they, they, they sort of present, come up with the core ideas, but it's for an ability, say, or a new class. Um, but it's always been very collaborative, and that's one of the satisfying things about it, because I love programming. I, I, get a, I get a lot of pleasure out of it, and you know, it's, it's like a zen state. If anything ever goes wrong in my life, I can just sit down and program and just forget all those other bad things. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a great part of my life, but I get to participate, and I get to make you know, art, you know, art feedback, art decisions, art calls, and same things with abilities, because it's very, very collaborative with abilities in particular, because you know, oh, I want this ability to do this, it should affect, you know, these people come near me and it should put this buff on them and they have these ideas and then as a gameplay programmer I can, you know, help them come up with a more, maybe more elegant solution or something like that. But all the scripting for all the game events is done in the Xeno tool and co in coordination with the story tool. So that's another, the story is another part of the pipeline, uh, the writer, T typically, you know, we work from an outline and then write the dialogue directly in the Inkle, in the Inkle, in Story Writer tool, and you can tag it. You can put your conditionals in there. Anything you need. I was kind of rambling, but maybe that gives you some uh, ideas about how some of the workflows handled. Um, 
Hi there. Um, I'm curious about your uh, separation of engine and data. That when you've gone from Banner Saga 1 to 2 and 3, mm -hmm. um, could you theoretically still load the assets of Banner Saga 1 into Banner Saga 3 engine, or are they entirely separate projects? It's totally, it's the same project. It's one engine, and it's totally data driven. Um, so, in fact, we do build all three games off of one version of the engine. I mean, we have different versions in source control for like supporting a live branch that's out on Steam right now. But for instance, we just submitted you know, Saga 1 and Saga 2 f to switch for uh, Lot Check, for Nintendo for Lot Check, and both of those are built on the same engine. And we keep it as, we keep it as close as possible to not let it diverge. So it is totally data driven. There's, there's, one, there's one thing that's not so data driven, and that's the UIs. And the reason for that is we built our UIs in Flash. And you can dynamically load Swift's runtime. There's no problem. So that's how we used to do it. And when we needed a UI, we'd load it, discard it when we're done. You could ch you know, change it on the fly, and artists could change it. But uh, when we went to iOS, I iOS policy for Adobe Air was to disallow that. You know, so we have to essentially compile the UIs into the game, which is kind of a pain in the ass, because it means only a programmer can really change the UIs. So aside from the, uh, the UI issue, the entire game is data-driven. It's all just, it starts with a single file called a saga file, so saga1.json, and that is the entry point for the whole thing, and it refers to all the other um, files in the project, and all the, all the scripting, all the logic takes place in kind of a bespoke, uh, you know, structured uh, scripting language that's all embedded in those files. Hello. Um, so your game is quite art heavy and I was wondering uh, for mobile how you could squeeze all those PNGs <laughs> uh, memory wise. Um, yeah, it was tough. Uh, fortunately, every time we release a new one so far, um, Apple has raised the uh, IPA size limit. So we're hoping they do that because I think uh, Banner Saga 1 was uh, 2 gigabytes on iOS, Banner Saga 2 is 3.4 gigabytes, and Banner Saga 3 is well over that. So. We'll, we'll see on that chart when we get to mobile how painful it is. We did, uh, the nice thing about the mobile version is it's it's almost entirely the same game. There's we didn't downres anything. All, the PNGs are exactly the same. Uh, the only thing different is that the move the videos are at 720p instead of 1080p, and um, the audio is slightly more compressed uh, for the sound effects. Not the music, but the sound effects are slightly more compressed. And normal human probably can't even tell the difference. So it, we're, we're proud of that, you know, that you can play on your iPad Pro and it's the same experience. Like you put on your headphones and you're getting the same experience on that platform, even though it costs half as much. Last question. Uh, hi. So uh, I've been wondering, since it's three games uh, over a long period of time, um, and very story heavy, I was wondering how much of the story was sort of planned out from the beginning and how much has it evolved over time? Um, the the large-scale arc of the story was planned out from the beginning. So you have this catastrophe in the world and the dredge reappearing and all these things happening. So the reason for that happening and where the story is going and how we're gonna, how that's going to resolve, what, are, what we're going to reveal to the player has been known. So the, the secrets behind this catastrophe and the overall structure of it. Um, now, of course, when you start writing each part, the, 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 you know, then the details start coming out. Like New characters are introduced, like Raga was a key f player in Saga 2 and will be in Saga 3. It wasn't in, ever in the design originally. He just kind of, like, you fled Borsgaard, and there was this governor who played like a tiny role, and like, well, maybe he, maybe he resurfaces and starts trying to exert his power. So that's an example of details coming out when you're fleshing out the story, for, you know, getting from A to B. Um, but the overall outline of the three acts has been known from the very beginning. And we were, you know, naively going to just do this whole thing. And it's funny because we started the project, the three of us, we figured we could live for about a year on our savings. We're going to make what we can in a year. It's going to be, you know, it's going to look good. It would, it, it would have probably looked the same fidelity, way less content, way shorter game. Um, 
and we were going to try to cram all this stuff in there. And we, some friends of ours gave us some good advice about that. And like, look, don't, it's going to take you six years. It's ridiculous. You're going to go out, you're just going to run out of money and, and fail. So it just was kind of already divided into a three-act structure. And, and that's what we did. It's like, okay, let's tackle this first one. And uh, if, it, if it does well, we'll continue. And that's what we've done. Yeah, one of the crazier parts about the storytelling is that it's branched. Um, so we have to, you know, sort of create the conspiracy theorist, like, crazy map on the wall, you know, with yarn of, like, oh, well, what if this guy's alive and she's dead? and you chose to take the baby with you. Um, you know, so it's like, well, what if you didn't take the baby, but he's dead and she's alive? Well, what about the reverse of that? And so that, that, that's part of, been part yeah. of the crazy fun of like carrying forward all the branch um, storytelling. But the, the payoff for that is that like for players, you, you feel that consequence where you're like, oh my gosh, you were tracking that? <laughs> um, I love that. You know, I, I love that as a player. So we, we hope that in Banner Saga 3, if like, if we caught, you know, like a detail and carried it forward from, from your version of the saga, you know, that, that you get that same feeling. Yep. All right. Well, thank you all for listening and paying attention, and we're really glad to see you.